Okay. So welcome everybody to our February Palliative Care Echo Lunch and Learn series. Uh, the session today is titled Supporting Patients Who Identify as Two-Spirit LGBTQ+, Who Could Benefit from a Palliative Approach to Care with Elder Albert McLeod. Uh, my name is May and I am the Program Assistant and Communications Coordinator for the Center for Education and Research on Aging and Health, um, or Sarah is how we, uh, we refer to it. Uh, I'm filling in today for my colleague, Stephanie Hendrickson. Uh, she is the ECHO coordinator for the Northwest Regional Palliative Care Program, the St. Joseph's Care Group hub site, uh, which is part of the National ECHO Project led by Pallium Canada. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Now, are you able to see that? Yep. Okay, great. Just going to, okay. So a bit about the ECHO project, if you're not familiar with it. It's a five-year national initiative aimed at cultivating communities of practice to establish ongoing professional development among healthcare professionals who care for people who could benefit from a palliative approach to care. Um, like I said earlier, if you visit the Pallium Echo Canada website, you'll find all of the sessions um, on various topics related to palliative care, all of which are available to you at no cost. Um, we want to say a big thank you to Health Canada. The Palliative Care Echo Project is supported by a financial contribution uh, from Health Canada, uh, and the views expressed herein do not necessarily represent the views of Health Canada. While we are joining each other virtually as the host of this session, Lakehead University respectfully acknowledges its campuses are located on the traditional lands of the Indigenous people. Lakehead Thunder Bay is located on the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. Lakehead University acknowledges the history that many nations hold in the areas around our campuses and is committed to a relationship with First Nation, Métis and Inuit based on the principles of mutual trust respect, reciprocity, and collaboration in the spirit of reconciliation. As a center, we are committed to working towards reconciliation and decolonizing our work and have committed to, as a staff to educating ourselves in these areas, both personally and professionally. On a personal note, I stand in solidarity with the original stewards of this land and my journey towards decolonization and reconciliation is ongoing and evolving. This includes active listening to the voices of indigenous peoples and continuous education for myself and for my children. We openly discuss as a family the injustices faced by Indigenous people, while also talking about the importance of acknowledging and respecting different ways of knowing. It's through these actions that we hope to contribute to a more equitable future. We would love to know more about all of you who are joining us. Uh, so we would love if you could enter your names, your roles, and where you're joining us from in the chat. Um, as you do that, uh, we're going to go over a few housekeeping um, points. We're very grateful to have Elder Albert McLeod here with us today, and I'm going to introduce him uh, momentarily. But in terms of housekeeping, just a few reminders. So keep your microphones muted unless you're asking a question. Um, as some of you uh, are already aware, this session will be recorded today. Um, for the question and answer period, uh, Elder Albert is hoping that we can save time at the end of the session for some questions and dialogue. Um, so you can enter the questions um, into the chat or any comments in the chat, and I can bring those forward for you. Um, you can also send me these questions privately if you wish to remain anonymous. Um, after Albert's session, uh, if you wish to come off mute to speak, please do just raise your virtual hand um, and then we can get to you there. Um, we will be sharing a link to the session evaluation afterwards as well. I'll put that in the chat and we would really appreciate it if you could fill that out for us. So um, on to the introduction. Albert McLeod is a status Indian with ancestry from the Nitsich Awayasik Cree Nation and the Métis community of Norway House in Northern Manitoba. He has over 30 years experience as a human rights activist and is former director of the Two-Spirited People of Manitoba. Albert began his two-spirit advocacy in Winnipeg in 1986 and became an HIV AIDS activist in 1987. He was the director of the Manitoba Aboriginal AIDS Task Force from 1992 to 2001. And as I was telling him earlier, that's a very, very humble um, and modest 
bio because Albert has done so much work um, with regards to Two Spirit and palliative care, and we could have talked the entire session about his bio, but um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and allow Albert to take over from here. So if you will, Albert, thank you. Thank you, May, and welcome everyone to this session. I'm going to find it again here. My, my slides. Um, can you see them? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, so um, in terms of two-spirit people and palliative care, this is an overview of sort of the end of life experience uh, for Indigenous people who identify as uh, LGBTQI or two-spirit. And uh, this image is from um, September 30th, which is the Reconciliation Day of all Indian residential schools and day schools in Canada. And it is to inform uh, Canadians and Indigenous peoples that two-spirit people were in those schools and have been impacted historically uh, by what happened in those schools, particularly the imposition of the binary gender and heterosexism on Indigenous minds, Indigenous communities. So uh, historically, uh, at, at contact, there was a lot of representation of two-spirit individuals who identified gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or intersex at contact, uh, but there's few records of their existence because of the oppression and censorship that happened in the post-contact era through the, you know, uh, um, uh, the church and the state uh, historically. So uh, most Americans know very little about how Indigenous people included Two-Spirit people in their communities and families. And here is uh, Wewa, who is a Lahamana, which is a trans female, transgender female in the mid 1800s. So we think about this time, there was many people who had similar experience as Wewa but again, it's one of the few documented records that we have the privilege of seeing in the 21st century. Now, uh, the pride flag, progressive flag flag on the left is sort of the most latest iteration of the pride flag, which includes people of color as well as transgender people. And there's a couple uh, that are specific to two-spirit people with the two feathers and the Madison wheel. In terms of how many two-spirit people there could be in Canada, I like to take a ratio of about 10% of the total population, which is 1.8 million. So potentially 180,000 people in Canada who are two-spirit people who will be showing up in services like palliative care. Um, that could be a low estimate, we don't know, because there is no research. It could be as high as I think as 30% of the population. Now in terms of some of the nuances in uh, uh, cultural care uh, for people who are in hospital or in hospice, some of these were identified by uh, Dr. Claire Branch in 1990, and these were unique uh, in his analysis of how children were raised, some of these uh, ethics or rules of behavior that are sort of, uh, you know, learned as children uh, culturally, and the, the tension becomes when they try to experience those in mainstream systems like hospitals. So the ethic of conflict suppression, non-interference, non-competitiveness, emotional restraint, uh, sharing, uh, the concept of time, social and cultural protocols, and humiliating superego. And the humiliating superego talks about uh, integration into your next peer group and uh, children, you know, between like, you know, uh, you know, from when they're very small to they're about seven or eight are doted on, they're spoiled to give them a strong sense of confidence. And then in order for them to assimilate into that next peer group, that super ego has to be mitigated so that they're not the center of attention uh, as they transition into their next peer group. Now, in terms of two-spirit people uh, living in a you know contemporary colonial state that is very heteronormative uh, and has idealized male and female roles uh, politically in our society, 
this trauma historically has been projected onto two-spirit people, as I mentioned, the inner residential schools and day schools, but I think society in general and this forced assimilation to be heterosexual, you know, whether it's in, you know, school as a child, at work, or even in the community. So some of that trauma relates to killing family-centered love and nurturing, homophobia and transphobia, exclusion, rejection, and shunning, incest and sexual assault, humiliation, shaming, and bullying, isolation and depression, murder or being disappeared, suicidal ideation and suicide, homelessness and poverty, uh, devaluing queer gender and sexual identity, intimidation and threats. And for people in you know, the sort of medical system or in hospital or palliative care or hospice care, these are some of the legacy experiences that some of the people of receiving care would have experienced and may be carrying uh, you know, in their end of life journey. Other ones uh, may come to the fore, especially when it gets emotional about end of life and uh, you know, terminal illness, uh, lateral violence, uh, gaslighting, ghosting, uh, microaggressions, cyberbullying, incest, sexual exploitation, or domestic violence. So, you know, the emotions around end of life can be triggers, bring up old issues, uh, maybe interconnected with uh, family dynamics or extended family issues may come to the fore as this person is in care. And so you're not dealing with the in individual's emotions, you're also dealing with the family and extended family around these sort of uh, uh, historical uh, triggers that are happening to them. In terms of two-spirit people, uh, uh, you know, in North America, uh, the impact of the AIDS pandemic that, you know, is ongoing globally. I think there's 4 million people around the world who do not have access to antiretrovirals out of the 39 uh, million people who were infected in the last 40 years. But for two-spirit people in Canada, we certainly have a legacy of maneuvering through end of life, palliative care, uh, hospice with our colleagues in the 20 years from uh, 1980 to 2000 when antiretrovirals were not effective and people would uh, you know, progress to what we call AIDS, uh, the end stage of HIV disease. And so uh, for many of my generation, we have a lot of experience uh, with end of life uh, and especially those very uh, complicated, uh, you know, opportunistic infections that we don't really see today anymore because of the antiretrovirals. But for many of us, we've gone through that history of being in hospitals, uh, ICU, uh, and, and those kind of things. Uh, and mostly dealing it on our own in our 20s in that uh, period. So this is a colleague of mine from Manitoba who died in 1987 at the age of 28. And again, uh, that era, HIV AIDS was very stigmatized. Not a lot of people uh, wanted to talk about it and certainly didn't want to step forward in terms of end of life care. Now, in terms of the uh, regular grief cycle, we understand, you know, uh, that it is, you know, something that we uh, get a lot of support around and that we eventually come out of that grieving period and uh, go on with our lives. And I, I work a lot with the AIDS Bereavement and Resiliency Program of Ontario that had mapped out, it's called a Multiple Ongoing Trauma-Related Loss uh, Model which really documents that, uh, you know, that historic trauma, that depression, some of the behaviors that might occur to somebody who is not just experiencing single loss uh, uh, grief, but also a multiple ongoing trauma and social loss as well. Uh, and in this case, it would be around the end of life. And uh, in terms of the, you know, details, uh, some of the issues uh, that people may be dealing with is the complexity of losses, 
self, significant place, people, places, things, hopes, and dreams, tangible and intangible, your community of meaning, the social political context of stigma and marginalization. And certainly this can apply to people who are at end of life or in palliative care or hospice. And so some of the challenges are around attaching or anticipating losses. And the little green hands are sort of the, the recommendation or the strategy is acknowledge difficulty in attaching. Then we have the single loss experience at the top, which we're mostly familiar with, and they're spread out, and we have a lot of family social supports around single loss. But when someone's going through a multiple loss journey, it's, it's harder to get that uh, acknowledgement or support. So uh, there can be you know, ongoing loss events, shock, anger, depression, and then into the sort of uh, area of grief, intense grief or despair, uh, where the person is experiencing meaningless hopelessness, depersonalization or suicidal thoughts. Now this model was put together by long-term survivors of HIV uh, who had gone through that to 20 year period, uh, what we call uh, the AIDS era. Some of the uh, recommendations are normalizing the confusion, give language, help make it real, some one-on-one -on -one peer or professional support, and then applying symbols, metaphors, and rituals. Uh, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of indigenous young women began to bead and to make ribbon skirts. So with that, you know, fear around COVID-19 and a lot of the unknowns in the early years, uh, you know, making symbols and using art as a mechanism to deal with the uncertainty and their feelings with the unknowns of the COVID-19 pandemic. And helping people uh, express a full range of feelings and then ex help express anger. And as Canadians, we are sort of loathe to be emotional or be angry. <laughs> and so there's that uh, aspect of helping people uh, express their anger. And certainly for two spirit people who are at end of life, there is a lot to be angry about. And then uh, coming out of this sort of uh, grief, uh, the helping hand is which part of self needs to die and help mourn. And so working with, uh, you know, not just, uh, you know, the person who's in care, but also the care team, the healthcare professionals, and the immediate family, uh, and moving from feeling of uh, being a victim of the situation to actually being an agent of healing and recovery, and then going on to ongoing self-creation, uh, and then going big or going small. And this is, you know, for the person who is ill, you know, their journey is going to be into the spirit world uh, after they pass away. Uh, so this is more around uh, the family and, and them at that time. And so for the individual, it would be explore what you believe to be true about yourself, what is lost and what is left, and then support shift to agency. And I think many people who work in palliative care do see this experience where people prioritize at the end who they want to see, what they want to do, uh, you know, what they want to do with their belongings. So that's their, uh, you know, preparing to depart. And then help reflect on survival, discovery, and growth to this point. Identify current challenges and capacities. And in the end, you know, it is about transformation. In this case, it would be you know, departing the physical world and as the indigenous people see it, the spiritual world, the life afterward. You know, reconnection to the soul's purpose, meaningful, purposeful engagement in life, the afterlife in this case, constructing a narrative that includes meaning of loss and the new orientation to the world. And so at the end, it is what is possible, what is meaning for you, what is your soul's desire? And the go big or go small is, you know, some people like privacy, uh, other people want things to be, you know, fabulous and uh, flamboyant. And so it's really uh, helping them achieve those objectives. Now, some of the end of life challenges, 
we're two spirit people. Uh, from my analysis, my point of view is uh, sort of the, the, the life expectancy and the difference in life expectancy between mainstream Canadians and Indigenous people. There is a gap there of about 15 years due to colonization, poor, poor housing, poor access to health care. And some of those might be related to late diagnosis, for example, hesitancy to have, uh, you know, approach a medical provider. It's very difficult to get a general practitioner today. Uh, so some of these more serious illnesses can happen, you know, midlife, later life, cancer, HIV or AIDS, diabetes, certainly is a huge issue uh, for the 50 plus population now hepatitis C complications. And then because of that sort of alienation of birth family or community, uh, dependence on chosen family, mostly in urban centers. And then the need to apply a trauma-informed and harm reduction care. As I mentioned, uh, you know, some people have experienced historic intergenerational trauma. And then we need to look at where that person is mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and how they perceive their end of life journey and their access to care. And when I worked uh, in hospitals, I know in some cases, uh, you know, patients believe uh, against medical advice. And certainly with my experience in people who were end of life, who were two spirit, they had things to do. And being in a hospital was not one of them. They have priorities, and so they would leave, leave, uh, you know, against medical advice, uh, you know, to visit family, uh, you know, to go to the gay bar or whatever they needed to do uh, as part of their, you know, end of life journey. Another issue, uh, you know, due to uh, you know discrimination and homophobia, is many two spirit people are dependent on the social service system for housing and food uh, and clothing and those kind of things. So financial issues are major at the end of life in hospitals or hospice, for example, housing uh, and uh, travel. And in case of people who are palliative, they may be housed at home. But again, that is an issue having home care supports while they are in the home. Travel is another huge issue, especially if they're from rural on reserve northern or remote communities, travel expenses for family, and even in urban centers, having bus fare uh, for family members to visit people in hospitals or hospice is a challenge. Uh, having access to things that we are generally used to having, like cell phones, can be expensive, access to Wi-Fi, and then what to do when there are emergencies, when there is no uh, finances available to address emergencies. Homophobia and transphobia in the healthcare system. And from my experience, it's really, a, a, for many transgender people, it is a challenge in the healthcare system because, you know, in the charts, uh, they may be identified as either male or female, and the system uh, sort of abides by their biological gender as in the chart even though they've been told to, you know, that this is a female person, identified person, and there's a female name or a male name if it's trans male, and they're expected to abide by that. But some staff feel compelled that this is the time they can assert their values on a vulnerable patient by what is called dead naming them, using the name of their previous gender identity. Uh, in, in the hospital care. And uh, it's more common uh, than you would think uh, with healthcare professionals that somehow are triggered that they feel obligated to do that for society. And it's actually against the law in Canada to discriminate against transgender people. Again, at the end of life, access to traditional healers, elders who are trained and uh, experienced in uh, ceremony to help that person deal with the reality of end of life, the grieving, and then preparation for transition to the spirit world. Uh, I think as well in institutions, advocacy and counseling is very important, especially if the person is isolated, uh, doesn't have family or doesn't have visitors. And I think that whole experience of being uh, uh, left alone 
emotionally and uh, socially isolated in a hospital is, or a care home even uh, is, is something that needs to be addressed. And then returning home uh, for many indigenous people that is, you know, at end of life, it is the idea or wish to return where they were born, if they were not born in the city, to return to their rural, uh, unreserved, northern or remote community uh, where they were raised as children. And I did work with uh, a friend of mine, a colleague who achieved that, lived 21 years with HIV, uh, came to the end of antiretroviral therapy in terms of he had become resistant I was told that, you know, to prepare, uh, his doctor told him, you know, for, you know, the end of his life. And instead he went to some healing ceremonies and took some healing tonics, uh, medicinal tonics and lived for another 10 years and returned to his Northern Reserve, was given a house and that's where he died in the North. So it really shows that it can be done. And I think in this case, Clarence, it was his sheer tenacity and will that he was actually able to accomplish that of returning home where he was born. Now, in terms of uh, resources and uh, with the recent Murder and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls uh, inquiry, uh, there were 32 uh, calls for a justice that were specific to two-spirit people. So that has really changed this dynamic in Canada about reconciliation, truth-telling, but also in terms of dealing with the violence of colonialism based on gender, particularly as it is experienced by Indigenous women and two-spirit people. As a result, our Prime Minister apologized in 2017 for the harms of the oppression and suppression of 2SLGBTQI plus Canadians. Out of that has come funding uh, for two-spirit organizations, which are identified in the slide in Canada. Uh, there are organizations plus councils that are advising na national groups like the Assembly of First Nations, uh, Treaty Number no. 3 uh, in Western Ontario, there are two Métis locals that are two-spirit, and then there's uh, the seven other groups that are formal organizations, nonprofit societies in Canada. So there is now uh, people available to advise uh, organizations around health care, uh, end-of-life care, uh, palliative care, or hospice care for two-spirit people. In terms of... Uh, some of the best practices, uh, you know, around two-spirit people is uh, for, you know, families or communities adapt to the two-spirit reality of your child. And that really is about parenting in that, you know, your child is a gift. If they're 2SLGBTQI, that is a gift. And that your role as a parent is not to force that child to be something they're not because you think that, you know, them representing heteronormativity or uh, the binary is ideal. For them, it's not ideal, right? So really it's adapting to that reality of your two-spirit child and being proud of your child. Uh, continue the love and nurturing. Uh, support two-spirit gatherings. And I was telling May earlier that this year I attended uh, last year, the 36th Annual International Two-Spirit Gathering outside of Halifax. It's a four-day gathering where we actually make a safe space for ourselves four days out of the year. And we've been doing it for 36 years. And this really predates this idea of reconciliation. That was, you know, as an outcome of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015 with the Indian Residential uh, Schools and Day Schools as well as the inquiry on the MMIWG2S, that we've been doing this uh, healing work uh, coming out of colonialism and re uh, reconciling our, our past and our future. So two-spirit gatherings, powwows, and they're quite extensive now in Canada and the United States, where we are uh, formally, you know, 
negotiating with our local communities and having these events. This weekend, I'm going up to York Factory First Nation. They're having a healing gathering for men, women, and two-spirit people. And uh, that's uh, one of our most northern uh, communities in Manitoba. So if that most you know rural, northern, isolated communities can do it, other communities can do it as well. Uh, support two-spirit chosen surrogate families, especially uh, in palliative of care and end of life. Uh, again, uh, those may be the more, uh, you know, closer relationships that happen in an urban context. It's chosen in surrogate families. And there is some emotion uh, that can be triggered at the time. Culturally, um, you know, the tradition is if you are First Nations from a, a rural community, uh, you know, they will send the chief and council to visit you in the hospital. Right, because you are a citizen of that nation, so they're obligated to come and visit you uh, in the hospital. The other ones are sort of addressing the tensions between family unresolved issues uh, with family uh, at that time. As I said earlier, could be triggers at this time. Uh, you know when you know people are attempting to make closure or uh, make contact. Uh, but again, it's up to the individual who they choose uh, to be their support at the time. And I think we need to focus on it because a lot of there's a lot of pressure, especially for the medical team to be communicating with the birth family around decisions that need to be made. And a lot of times cho chosen or surrogate families are left out of those uh, conversations and choices. Uh, create and support two-spirit rites of passage. Again, the resurgence or re-emergence or rites of passage in the Indigenous community around male and female identity and roles. And there's nothing particularly around two-spirit rites of passage, and we need to address that gap. Uh, affirm two-spirit gender identity, expression, and pronouns. And this is critically important in palliative care in terms of how that person wants to be, uh, you know, understood, uh, related. Uh, there's cases where, you know, my trans female friends were in hospital and uh, the staff didn't shave them. So they were growing a beard. And so it was just whether it was through ignorance of the staff or that, you know, it's intentional neglect, that that sensitivity was not there. And again, the whole issue around de the dead naming of people because of what is written in the chart. Uh, include two spirit people in cultural, spiritual, and political events. Uh, and then provide two spirit specific sexual health information. How are you guys doing? <laughs> We're almost in time for conversation. I've been going really You're fast. You're good, Albert. You're great. <laughs> Some of the end of life rituals, and this is not just particular to indigenous people, but again, because you know we have a very strong colonial past that is Euro-Christian, we've really adopted some of those sort of colonial Christian Christian practices at end of life. But some of the unique ones uh, for people in palliative care is the mixing of Western medicine uh, in in the hospital or hospice. Uh, with traditional plant medicines, as I mentioned, tonics, teas, uh, and we could never discount, you know, that person's spirit or uh, quest to live, even if they are end of life. They've been told, you know, they are terminal, you know, end of life is coming, that especially for young people uh, in, in this situation, their desire to live is very powerful. Like it's an innate part of their identity and spirit that all the reality may be they're dying, but truly they want to live. So there can be these end of life things where they will choose healing methodology or rituals to avert that, right? And it could be tonics or teas that are mixed with, uh, you know, the medicine that the hospital gives. And I've seen that happen is, in ICU units as well, 
where uh, you know one one patient uh, the North sent uh, a, a soup to her, you know, as a healing uh, uh, tonic for her. Then uh, some of the complications in our Western hospitals is the smudging or the uh, cleansing ritual that uses smoke. Could be sage, cedar, tobacco, or sweet grass. Uh, so many facilities are set up for that. They have external exhausts in these circular rooms or rooms so that that can be facilitated, as well as healing drum songs, so bringing in elders who can sing these songs. Uh, then uh, at end of life, uh, the whole issue around funeral, funeral homes and obituaries. Uh, who's going to pay for that? It can be up to $10,000 for a funeral and a viewing uh, involving the casket. Uh, some First Nations uh, can contribute to that if you're a citizen. Some don't. Depends who you are or how long you've been away from your community. And obituaries are very expensive, like a few thousand dollars in a newspaper. So in many cases, there really is no obituary. But I think with the use of Facebook or Instagram, that notice gets to come out. Uh, you know, it's just kind of like a, a form of an obituary, but uh, very few for two-spirit people, formal obituaries in newspapers. Uh, then a, a sacred fire, either in the urban environment, uh, in many cases, sometimes even outside the facility, the hospital or hospice. But certainly after the person has passed away, ideally a four-day sacred fire. And that could be at someone's house where the family would meet. And that sacred fire would go for uh, 24 hours until the four days ended. Uh, traditionally, uh, especially in northern communities, awake. In the old days, awake was four days. Part of that was so that people could have time to travel to the funeral. And so in the old days, they had dog sleds or skidoos uh, before or airplanes. Now, you know, it's, it's much more easier to travel. So that's why the wake was over four days. Sometimes they're one day or two day wakes. And really, it is that sort of preparation and uh, closure for family to, you know, if, it, if the body's there to do the viewing. Then uh, the need for a funeral, burial, or cremation, and a feast. And again, where and how that happens, and if it happens. You know, as a post, you know, COVID-19 impact, and, uh, you know, the isolation of people in ICU uh, wards or uh, hospital wards, and they were family was not able to come and do that end of life uh, a process. So there's many people who have been cremated over the last three and a half years where there has not been a funeral or a service. Uh, we're doing one in April for one of our elders here. She died in 2020, right? And this is the first uh, end of life um, ceremony for her. Four years it's taken. So again, you're not just dealing with historical trauma you're also dealing with the trauma of surviving the pandemic and the multiple losses that happened in the pandemic. And usually a society who goes through trauma like that is not able to reflect on it or speak about it until about 50 years later, right? So it takes a long time for society to process what happened in the trauma and to be able to talk about it. So we're kind of out of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic but it is those lingering uh, aspects of what happened to us, you know, uh, and the trauma of going through that. Uh, the need for a headstone as a marker, you know, for the to honor that person's existence. For many two spirit people who have died, there is no headstone, and so it really is a part of that erasure of identity could be related to stigma still, homophobia or transphobia, why two-spirit people don't have a grave site or a headstone. And then thinking about the family afterward, uh, you know, and I notice especially with youth um, who have two-spirit friends, 
sometimes uh, who are not gay or transgender, they are kind of neglected, right? Uh, and that, that loss is really not equa equ equated to the loss of a friend who is heterosexual, right? So there's all these layers that are happening, you know, we're right now in an overdose uh, epidemic in Canada, many youth are losing their friends. And again, that is a stigmatized situation where the, they're not able to talk about that. Some of the resources, so we had worked in the past with the Canadian Virtual Hospice, who's done a lot of work with the 2S and LGBT community and developed a number of resources around healthcare. The Canadian Healthcare Bill of Rights, the grief modules, and then the My Choices for Safe and Inclusive Healthcare, and that includes arrangements for end of life. There's a booklet that will walk the person through because it, they kind of ask the, the questions that need to be answered but are difficult to bring up in a family situation. And it's, it's, it's not complicated, it's easy to read. And then this other one uh, from the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, uh, promoting to us LGBTQI plus health equity. It's a big thick manual. And that's all, folks. Wonderful. That was great. Thank you so much. So much information. I have a ton of notes that I've taken. <laughs> um, so now I think we're going to open it up for Q&A um, or comments. And as I had said before, if you would like to ask them yourself, feel free to put your hand up um, or um, ask them in the chat and I will get to them. We've got a couple of comments in the chat. Olga says, fantastic. Thank you so much. I know she had made a comment earlier about your visuals and how um, great they were. They are so great, like just really well thought out. And um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing those. Um, Maxine says, incredible vital information. Thank you so much, Albert. Debbie says, thank you. Lots of great information. I agree. Jerry, did you have a comment? Uh, no. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I just saw you were off mute here. I'll help. I'll move you there. I think in some cases, you know, depending on the situation, it might be the healthcare provider who becomes the surrogate or chosen family member. Just because, you know, when you are in a large hospital, um, you know, it's hard for family to be there you know, uh, away from their own family. So a lot of times there is a lot of loneliness and isolation. So in many cases, it is the staff on the ward who become that family at the end of life. Yes. And there was, I did meet a nurse um, years ago who had worked with uh, a young man in Toronto who was dying of AIDS and there was no visitors and she didn't know what to do. And she knew that in the culture, feathers were important to Indigenous people. So she went down to the street and she found a pigeon feather and came back up and put it on this pillow. Right? And to me, it does not seem like much, but it is the humanity behind it as a healthcare provider that, you know, she, she intuitively felt something needed to be done. You know, to honor this person's in existence. Because in reality, you know, that erasure can be uh, complete. No one really cares about this person because they're stigmatized. They may have AIDS and no one wants to reconnect. So they do die alone, which is a tragedy because as Indigenous people, we have treaty rights, we have, you know, First Nations rights, Métis rights, and Inuit rights. And to sort of die with that neglect is horrendous. So, you know, kudos to this nurse who, who understood, you know, at some level to 
be empathetic and compassionate to this person. Yeah, definitely. Just that, you know, concept of cultural safety, cultural humility, yeah. competency, um, how important it can be at end of life. Um, I see that Olga, you have a question. I wanted to offer maybe a story. So I am not a first, I don't identify as a First Nation person, um, yet I have relations with First Nation people, Aboriginal people, and those who dance in this LGBTQI2S um, communities. And um, I was so grateful for having the technology and for having the ability to understand and um, know the importance of songs and chants when someone is dying. Mm -hmm. And so I was, uh, through my relations, the power of for healthcare for my friend. And so while I was dying, because I understood these important ways that we need to identify unique relationships through legal forms, I was able to have communication with the healthcare providers, um, and my friend understood that. We had many ups and downs through emergency engagements and healthcare engagements. Um, and so I, I was so grateful for the technology and for the opportunity for that one person who was another um, relation, <laughs> who was not family of origin, um, and we were able to hold... Um, the space through that process, through the song, through the technology, um, and and the space was created. Um, and so I'm, I, I share this story because my friend <laughs> continues to remind me to share the story um, because these are really important ways that allies can also speak about um, because it's not always easy to advocate. It often puts um, many of our own life at risk and it's it's worth doing it is so worth doing so i just want to share that um as an ally and as somebody of um those kinds of complex relationships and um extending compassion thank you so much for offering all of these wonderful teachings and the ways in which they can weave into my already existing knowledge thank you thank you thank you olga that was lovely um, there was a question in the chat from Megan. It says, within our healthcare facilities, do you have any recommendations for how we can signal or indicate to our two-spirit patients that we are safer providers, um, recognizing how unsafe these facilities can be and are? Well, I think it's, it's again, training and, you know, symbology. We have the, the flags, right? Uh, we also have stickers. And you know, you know, safety and safer is is a subjective idea, and we try and do our best. But I think you know, um, uh, you know, uh, and there's always you know, uh, yay or nay about having a sticker on your door of a pride flag. But I think it's better than nothing. And training, and just training in terms of the. Uh, the namings, right, and recognizing someone's, uh, you know, uh, gender identity as they tell you. And, you know, I was in a hospital where my friend was dying of TB. She had end of life with AIDS, and uh, her name was Tanya. And when I was on the ward, uh, the nurse kept saying the boy name as a, uh, to correct me, right? Tanya was unconscious but the nurse felt obligated to try and correct me, <laughs> right? And that's not their job, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, so, so there's that training and people need to be, to get as much, as many times until they eventually get it, right? Because my friends right now, a couple of them are transgender and are in hospitals here and they are complaining because they they are being dead named by the staff still, you know. Yeah, and what purpose does that serve? <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Yeah, that's that's awful. Um, and I feel they would have extra challenges and barriers just being indigenous and yeah, and then identifying um, as two spirit and transgender. Yeah. 
that's a lot of stigma attached to one person. Um, Darlene, did you have a comment? No? I, I had a question. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks so much for the great presentation and the wonderful visuals, Albert. Um, the comment that you mentioned, you I'm curious if you could elaborate more on the detail you mentioned earlier that it takes 50 years for societies to make sense of and reflect on large scale crisis events like COVID. Uh, that just really struck me. And I'm wondering where this comes from and why do you think that is? Well, if you look at the Holocaust survivors, many of them, I think the Shaw Project um, were the, you know, 40,000 survivors documented in the mid nineties, their experience during the Holocaust. Um, those were the select few who could tell our story. Many didn't, were never able to. And I think with, um, you know, 9-11, which we all experienced, uh, you know, uh, 23 years later, you know, it's history, but people uh, don't talk about it, right, of what happened that day. And, you know, for myself, I was in New York last year, and I went to visit the site, memorial site. Um, and for me, that was closure, right? Uh, because I wouldn't watch any documentaries about 9-11, I avoided it because I did not want to go through that experience again. So for me, uh, and the youth that were in there, they were not even born then, right? But they were in that memorial and it's very well done. But the scope of that tragedy and that trauma still, I think is with us. And we don't talk about it, right? We don't talk about what we felt, what we went through. And, um, so for me, that was closure. And that took like, what, 20, 23 years, 22 years to, to face it right, when I was in New York. I think of like residential school survivors as well. Yeah. Who don't yeah. like to talk about their experiences in the schools. Um, you yeah. know, I was working in long-term care and I had one resident saying that he was having flashbacks um, and he yeah. said he's never talked about it with anybody before. And he was, you know, in his 80s at that point. Yeah. 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 And I think with COVID, you know, we're out of it. But I think what we went through emotionally and psychologically, we're not at a place of really having that conversation yet. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks for that. I really appreciate that, particularly with considering uh, bigger decisions with palliative care thinking about the expanding that thinking of those multiple crises um but those poly crises that that and relates to that visual that you shared as well so yeah thanks for that yeah, and there's actually a video of the multiple loss journey mapping through aids bereavement and resiliency project they just uh aired it last year because of the multiple overdose deaths that service providers are dealing with again another stigmatized uh end of life situation uh, that staff are dealing with, but who do they talk to about it, right? So, so they have a video, short video on their website that walks you through the theory of that model. That's good to know. Uh, any other questions or comments? I think going big is going to Cuba in February for a vacation. <laughs> Self care. I wish, yeah. <laughs> um, so I just popped the evaluation form in the chat here. I'm also just going to quickly uh, share my screen again. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us um, and thank you, Elder Albert. Um, as always, your teachings and your knowledge are just so um, incredibly appreciated and um, always seem to 